Unreal Engine is great for filmmaking, but the last thing you want is for your renders to look like a video game. So why don't your 3D renders look as cinematic as your favorite movies? It's not because of the software, it's because of your technique. All you need is Unreal Engine 5 and these three tips that you can start applying right after this video. So if you're ready to stop playing games and start making movies, subscribe to the channel and together we'll break down three Unreal secrets to create cinematic photo reel renders. What's up, my name is Josh Tunin, and for the last eight years I've worked on Hollywood visual effects as an artist and supervisor on movies like Star Wars, Dungeons and Dragons, and Across the Spider-Verse. And I started using Unreal Engine 5 on set in virtual production and to create animated films of my own. So I wanna share three secrets that I learned from an upcoming Mr. Freeze short film made entirely in Unreal Engine that you can use to immediately improve your renders. Now, a lot of people have asked me, how do I make my renders look cinematic? And if I had to give the answer in one word, it would be lighting. Now, I've already made some in-depth lighting tutorials that you can check out, but I wanna share one of my favorite resources, Shot Deck. Here you can find high resolution stills from your favorite movies and analyze why and where they place the lights. If you look at all of these different movies, you'll notice one thing in common. All we have is a person standing in a room. And yet some shots look boring and others look cinematic. So what's the difference? It's the lighting. Usually the more dynamic the lighting looks, the simpler the lighting setup is. In this case, it's literally just one key light that's lighting up this entire scene. Or in shots like this, there's just one main light overhead lighting up his face and another one coming from the side so that we get this rim light on the side of his forehead and across the back of his shirt. So cinematic lighting doesn't come from putting a ton of lights in your scene, it's from putting one to three lights in the right places. And oftentimes you just wanna light one half of the face by making sure one side has light and the other has shadow. It's really important to create contrast between the brightest parts of your image and the darkest parts. And the bigger difference between these two, the more contrast you'll have. So let's break down this lighting setup one light at a time. The first light are these overhead lights, creating a lot of nice backlight and also fill light across the scene directly coming from these fluorescent lights in the background. These are just images of fluorescent lights placed in the scene and plugging them into the emissive channel and letting that do all of the hard work. The next light is this overhead key light, which is really here to help separate Victor from the background. We want to avoid a completely monochromatic image, so getting a little bit of a warmer light in here helps separate him from the green background. The third light is our rim light, and this is just brought in to get a little more punch and style and edge out of our character. And again, you can see this really starts to light up the edge here, and we want to brighten up Victor's face so our attention goes directly to him. And then as an accent and to incorporate the glowing eyes into the scene, I wanted to add in this red underlight, which helps tie everything together. We get a little bit more color and it almost appears like the light is being cast from his eyes onto the bridge of his eyebrows. And with these four simple lights, we went from a fairly monochromatic, simple scene into something dynamic and full of contrast and color. But here's where a lot of people get it wrong. Right now we're looking at still images or photographs, but if you wanna make movies and cinema, then you have to make your images move. And we can do that by adding movement into our lights. Let's jump into this scene with Mr. Freeze and check out how. The first technique was taking this rope simulation and adding a light to it. By creating this simple physics interaction using a physics constraint and recording it using take recorder, and by parenting a light to this simple interaction, we get this subtle but effective light animation throughout our entire shot, and you can see the shadows move across Victor's face. The other technique is animating cast shadows. As you can see, I didn't want to build a complicated environment, but I wanted the impression of machinery and equipment moving in the background. Instead of building complicated geometry, I just took this single spotlight and pointed it at the background, and then I found this fan in the Quixel library, and by placing this directly in front of the light and adding a simple rotation animation to the fan, the shadow implies a huge environment beyond what we can see in this one shot, but the environment itself is almost non-existent. So I hope that gives you a couple ideas to get started to add some quick animation to your lights inside of Sequencer. But lighting is only one part of the puzzle when making a photo reel image. So how do you make a photo reel render? Well, let's break down the word. Photo realism. You need your renders to look like a photograph 
meaning all the imperfections you get from shooting through a camera lens. Now a shortcut to make your shots look more cinematic is to create shallow depth of field with your lens. This is how we get the large orbs and bokeh in the background of our images. Now there's multiple ways to do this and I wanna walk through both depending on your shot. Now in sequencer, this is controlled within the camera. I'll expand my cine camera here and our two most important settings are gonna appear right at the top inside of sequencer and that's aperture and focal length. Focal length is the amount of zoom we have on our lens, which greatly affects the composition of our frame and aperture controls the depth of field. So the lower the number, the more out of focus and the higher the number, the more focus we'll have. Now, if you're looking for a magic number, I usually start around two, but you can always cheat this lower down to something like 1.4, but be careful as soon as you're getting into anything below one, we're creating a lens that would never actually work in real life. So we're stretching and breaking reality further than we really could. So naturally it'll look less photorealistic if we start breaking the rules. Now you should also know that the focal length will change the amount of depth of field as well. The more that we zoom in here, you can see how shallow our depth of field is. And just remember, a wider lens is gonna have less depth of field and a zoomed in lens is gonna have shallower depth of field. The more you zoom in, the more out of focus the background's gonna be. And to take this even further, the best practice is to add in extra dynamic particle effects and decals into the background so we actually have more reason to see bokeh inside of our shot. So by taking these Niagara particle effects and moving them further in the background or closer to the camera, we can increase or reduce the amount of depth of field they contribute and putting them really close to the lens can give you some really interesting results. So try adding in snow, rain, blowing leaves or any small particles close to camera and try this out. Now there's two types of lenses, spherical and anamorphic. A spherical lens will have a circular bokeh and an anamorphic lens will have a stretched oval bokeh. Spherical is a bit more true to life where anamorphic is associated with a lot more imperfections and a dirtier image. This doesn't automatically make your shots look cinematic, but it can dirty up your image in a way that most people don't associate with CG. They associate it with Hollywood films. So by mimicking these anamorphic qualities in your CG renders, you can get more photorealistic results. Now changing between spherical and anamorphic bokeh inside of Unreal is really simple. Just select your camera and then go down to the lens settings and this squeeze factor setting and we can use this to squish down our bokeh shape. So if we change this from one to two, this will make our bokeh a lot thinner but it'll also stretch our image by twice the width. So all we have to do is go into our film back, go to your sensor width and then just divide this by two. And you can see we'll get the same exact resolution we had before, but now we have nice anamorphic oval bokeh. And here's a small tip. Sometimes if you're going really shallow on your depth of field, you can start to break some of your materials in the background, but thankfully there's an easy fix. One thing you might notice if you have semi-transparent or translucent objects in the background is it might seem at first like they're incompatible with the depth of field system inside of Unreal. But fixing this is really easy. Here we have our translucent fog material and if I press on the brown box and type in DOF for depth of field, you wanna make sure this translucency pass is set to before depth of field. Now when I apply this and we see the changes in the scene, you'll see that it starts to react naturally like you'd expect through a camera lens. Now the last step to make a photo real image is compositing. This is the last step of polish that we're putting on our finished renders to give them even more imperfections and mimic all of the qualities of a camera lens. And it's really important because if you skip a single step here, your shots won't look photo real. Whether you use After Effects, Nuke, or DaVinci Resolve, all these techniques apply. So let's talk about the three imperfections that you wanna to add to every single render to make something that looks CG and make it look photographic. The first thing I always add in is lens diffusion. This has the biggest impact and this one step can take images that look really CG and make them look a lot more photographic. But what's the biggest reason? The biggest problem to overcome with CG is a lot of things can end up looking perfect when they're created in a computer. But by blurring our image, we can get a lot more imperfection and randomness that you'd expect coming through a camera lens. Oftentimes with CG, we'll get really crisp, dark blacks in our image. But when you're using an anamorphic lens, 
oftentimes you'll get this really soft glow coming from your light sources. In a CG image, you might expect this silhouette to be perfectly black and have no orange color contaminating some of these shadows. But because they use these dirty anamorphic lenses on the Batman, we get a lot of light contamination coming from our sun source. And all we have to do to recreate this is blur our image at different intensities, some really small and some with really big blurs like values of over 300, and then just mixing the two together. And now you can see we get some nice contamination into the shadows while still looking very realistic. And we get some additional colors into these dark areas where we had no information or detail before. So on a shot like this, a little bit of diffusion can go a really long way in terms of contaminating our blacks by adding haze onto our lens and into our environment. The next step is adding in chromatic aberration. A lot of times when shooting with cheaper or older lenses, you'll get some color separation infringing around your brighter areas. And this is known as chromatic aberration. Essentially what happens is when light enters your camera lens, if that glass isn't perfectly fine tuned, by the time that light travels to hit the sensor of the camera where the image is captured, our different wavelengths between the red, green, and blue can travel differently. And oftentimes this is most notable around the corners of your lens. Now this is definitely becoming more widely known in CG, but I think a lot of people are implementing it in the wrong way. With chromatic aberration, less is more, but it's really important to know how to apply it correctly. Let's take a look at this still from the assassination of Jesse James and see how this technique looks when captured through a real camera. When we go towards the edge of the frame, you can see that we get blue on one side and red on the other. But to really understand what's happening, we have to look at each channel, the red, green, and blue channel. If I compare the red channel with the blue channel, if you look at this lamp or around the edges of the frame, you can see that it almost looks like it's being scaled down slightly. So we're not just offsetting our R, G, and B channels, we're scaling them to different sizes. So in Nuke, my preferred technique is to use the God rays and then scale our image larger or smaller. This will give us more aberration and differences around the edge. And by using God rays instead of scale, we'll get more smooth imperfections compared to the traditional chromatic aberration from inside of Unreal. Camera lenses will bounce around light and move things slightly differently, as opposed to perfectly scaling the R, G, and B channels like you get inside of Unreal. But it doesn't take long before you start breaking your image. So again, less is more, and you just wanna make sure that you're getting some new colors introduced around the edges, enough to get some new colors and some fringing without drawing attention to itself when you're looking at the whole image. So make sure to scale your images, don't translate them to get the separation, because very quickly this starts to look like an anaglyph 3D movie instead of a nice subtle effect that will make your shots look more realistic. And then the last thing I like to add are lens flares. Whenever you can, it's always best to use real life footage captured through a camera lens, and by mixing real life footage with our CG renders, it's a lot harder to tell where one starts and the other stops. And in my opinion, adding in lens flares are the easiest way to add that last step of color, polish, and randomness into your scene while still grounding your shots in real life. And if you add these three things to any shot, you'll remove that CG curse, some of that digital perfection that you get from making a virtual scene. This is the exact method I use when creating the samurai sword fight for War of Being. By creating simple render templates, I could apply the same lens effects to my entire film, giving each shot a more realistic feel. And by templating this process and making it extremely quick with just a few sliders, you can spend all your time creating inside of Unreal instead of waiting around for renders. So if you wanna improve your renders inside of Unreal, or even just use the same exact compositing template that I used here, you might wanna check out Unreal Fundamentals. If you're new or struggling to learn Unreal and you wanna take your work to the next level, then you should check out our 21 day Unreal Filmmaking Bootcamp to go from a complete beginner to an Unreal filmmaker making your own animations and previs inside of Unreal. I've taken everything I've learned, every cheat sheet, every template, and every resource and combined them all together in one place. 
So take your future in visual effects and filmmaking into your own hands and get started today. And make sure to share what you create by the end of the course. Subscribe below if you want to see more. Otherwise, check out our behind the scenes of Tesseract's music video for War of Being. We show you exactly how we made this samurai sword fight using motion capture and Unreal Engine step by step. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Peace.